Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wayne Lewis, and I have the privilege of serving as your moderator for this afternoon's um, HESI post-COVID webinar series. Um, today's event is titled, Can We Choose Our Way to Better Schools? Um, and we are privileged to have three outstanding panelists as our guests today, who I'll introduce to you in just a moment. I'm sure that for many, if not all of the attendees today, the topic of school choice is not a new one. Those of us who have been passionate about improving schools um, and interested in whether or not school choice, parental choice provides us the opportunity uh, to leverage market mechanisms to improve the quality of education that kids receive um, are no strangers to this conversation. But what has happened uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic in particular is we've seen a, a, a changing of the landscape, a changing um, in the way even ordinary citizens and parents think about and conceptualize school choice. We hear folks who would never have entertained the school choice conversation prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and the post um, or our emerging post pandemic realities have serious conversations about what school choice could mean in their communities and in their states. And so we look forward to engaging these three dynamic folks in some conversation. So let me introduce our panelists to you. First is, um, Dr. Paul Peterson, who is the Henry Lee Shaddock Professor of Government and Director of the Program on Education Policy and Government, Governance at Harvard University, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and senior editor of Education Next, a journal of opinion and research. Paul is a former director of the Center for American Political Studies at Harvard, and of governmental study and of the governmental studies program at the Brookings Institute. He received his PhD in political science at the University of Chicago. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Education and has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the German Marshall Foundation and the Center for Study in the behavior in the behavioral sciences. We're so pleased to have Dr. Paul Dr. Paul Peterson with us. Our next panelist is Starlee Coleman. Starlee serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the Texas Charter Schools Association. Yes. Um, so Starlee has 20 years of experience turning public policy into law through strategic, strategic public affairs and PR campaigns, grassroots engagement, coalition development. Starley has contributed to the passage of dozens of bills in state legislatures, Congress, and at the ballot box. As CEO, Starley's role is to oversee the daily operation of the organization and to help ensure that TPCSA's policy mm -hmm. recommendations cross the finish line, whether the finish line ends at a governor's desk, city hall, or on an election ballot in the courtroom. And finally, last but not least, our third panelist is Robert C. Enlow, President and CEO of EdChoice. Before the establishment of EdChoice in 2016, Robert was an integral part of the Milton and Rose Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice from its founded, founding in 1996. He served as fundraiser, projects coordinator, vice president and executive director prior to being named as president and CEO of the foundation in 2009. Under his leadership, EdChoice has become one of the nation's most respected and successful advocates for educational choice, working in dozens of states to advance parental freedom and education by disseminating research, undertaking training, sponsoring seminars, conducting advertising campaigns, and investing in and organizing community leaders. Thank you to all of our distinguished panelists. We are thrilled to have you and we're excited about beginning this conversation. So to get us started, lady and gentlemen, I wanna pose a question that I'll ask all of you to respond to. And it really serves as the framing question for the conversation we wanna have this afternoon. 
And it is simply, can we choose our way to better schools? Paul, can we start with you? Well, I've thought about that question and I've, it seems to me we already are improving our schools through uh, choice. And the evidence that I have looked at myself has been from the National Association uh, Assessment of Educational Progress, uh, the NAEP as it's called. Uh, it shows that actually, if you look over the last 20 years, the students who are attending charter schools have been improving at a faster rate. That is the new cohorts coming in are doing better than previous cohorts uh, than in the, in the uh, district schools. So you're seeing that choice is actually, it, it, when you started off the charter schools weren't that much better than the district schools, but there's now a noticeable difference between the charter school sector and the district sector. The charter schools have been steadily improving improving, and it's especially true in the African-American community, the community that uh, is especially in need of, of charter schools. So I think that's a very uh, important finding in my opinion, and it, it really is not any different than the one in, in, that was uh, found in Texas uh, uh, earlier that uh, it showed that the Charter schools in Texas were improving at a more rapid rate than the uh, other schools in the state. And yet there's a new study out from Boston that shows that the, the district schools, where they face competition from charters, they're doing better. So choice is already making progress. And we see this especially in some places like uh, Miami and Washington, D.C., where you've got a lot of choice out there and the, these systems seem to be uh, uh, improving uh, really uh, at a much uh, faster rate. So there's more to be said, but I'll turn it over to the other panelists. Starley, I'll come to you next with anything that you would add. Can we choose our way to better schools? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think as Dr. Peterson just said, I think, I think we're starting to see evidence that we can. Um, uh, he, he mentioned the, the NAEP trend line for, for charter schools and some data that's emerging about how charter school performance, and I, I would say that it's not just, um, not just charter schools that, uh, that have an impact, but, but other school choice programs as well. Um, we're seeing here in Texas, not only on the NAEP, but on our state assessment as well, that districts that have charter schools inside of their boundaries, so not necessarily charter schools that are authorized by a school district, but um, our authorization here in Texas is done at the state level, but for districts that have charter schools where the kids can, you know, living in a particular neighborhood can choose a charter or, or choose to stay at their district school, those, not only are the charter kids doing better, but the district kids are doing better as well. So I think this is one of those things that's really interesting, right? We, we know without a doubt now, data is showing us over and over and over again in all kinds of communities, all kinds of ways that not only do kids in school choice programs thrive, but the kids who remain in their district schools also thrive because, uh, you know, schools have to respond um, when uh, when a when a school choice a school of choice comes in and provides something that parents want. They have to you know they have to match, and that's good for kids. That's not something to be afraid of. That's something to embrace. Um, and I think it's really important that we that we celebrate um, the fact that that you know competitive pressure. Uh, makes districts respond because the vast majority of kids in America stay in their school district. They go to their assigned neighborhood school. And if we want school choice to have the kind of system-wide impact that, that we all want it to have, um, then we need to keep seeing this kind of data that not only um, do the kids in the program uh, do better, but that it that the pressure that it creates makes districts respond. Um, and I, so I think, I think the answer is yes, obviously we're still just on a really small scale now. Um, obviously that's why Robert um, and his team are doing so much work to pass more school choice laws, but um, you know, but I, I think the evidence would suggest that 
that we can choose our way to better schools. Robert, what are your thoughts? So, and first of all, thank you, Harvard and Hoover, for having me. And it's nice to see you all on, on this uh, panel. I'm going to give a, the best academic answer I can based uh, to, to give honor to Pop Professor Peterson. And the answer to it that I would say is yes and no, uh, to give a proper way of looking at it. Uh, both Professor Peterson and, and Mackie Raymond from Credo have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt, in my opinion, based on the the vast majority of studies and, and what people need to realize is charter schools and private school choice programs have been studied more than any other reform uh, in education combined many times over. And what we know from those studies are kids are doing slightly better on some standardized tests. They're attaining more, they're graduating more, they're going to college at higher rates, they're matriculating, they're staying in. And we know that the public schools are, are getting better. So we know that the choice that we've given so far has been beneficial. So on that answer is yes. Uh, the no part of it, I think, is for uh, uh, us to think about a little bit further is the programs we're talking about are not big enough. They're not large enough and they're not sustainable enough in many instances without, with the exception now of a few states like Arizona, Florida, Indiana, West Virginia, outside of the charter school side, because charter schools are very big, like in California and New York. But um, if we're going to truly choose our way to choice, then we actually have to combat and deal with the fact that we have a school assignment system that's based on some fairly unjust principles, like where you live and what kind of zone you're zoned to, and what kind of person you might be. There's a lot of challenges. And so if choice doesn't actually deal with those realities of the current structure of the current system, then I think the answer to that is no. We won't ultimately to be able to choose our way out. So I think the answer is both yes and no. Robert, I'd like to, to stick with you um, as we, we move into some additional conversation. One of the, the things that has frustrated me um, for years as I've done this work and trying to um, create policy frameworks that allow for additional options for um, for kids, kids and families is the straw man argument that um, charter schools or choice um, programs are created to advent to to create um, loopholes or create spaces for more advantaged kids um, at, at the 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 expense um, of kids who need who truly need more opportunities. Um, what would you say to that argument? Or, or are there things that we can do in school choice policy um, or have done to ensure that kids who need great options are the ones who are getting those options and not just kids who already have advantages? So I appreciate that question, and, it, and it's a good question we hear a lot, and, and I'm going to uh, get on a soapbox a little bit. The answer is our current system is creating more advantages for more advantaged kids because of the way we do zip code assignment, and that's just a reality in this country. So if we're talking about creating spaces for more advantaged kids, that's the way the current system works. Choice programs, on the other hand, have been working very hard to try and design policies to ensure that those that don't have the same advantages as wealthy families have the same opportunities to choose. That's what we've been doing so far, and it's been working. There's most every choice program in the country is specifically designed for children who have greater educational needs or uh, don't have the income levels to uh, be able to choose. Now, that's just private school choice programs. Charter schools are open to everyone. You know, the irony is, is that charter schools basically are open to everyone. Here's what we know from the data. Poor children choose charters at significantly higher rates because this is just logic. If you're happy with your current school, are you gonna move? No, if you're unhappy, you are. And so this is where the opportunities to choose, particularly for, for lower income families are so important. Thank you, Robert. You know, in that same area, Starley, I think the, the data are really clear that choice programs serve more kids of color, um, particularly or specifically more African American and Hispanic students um, than white or Asian students. That's that's clear. It's a, um, something that's that's widely known, though it's it's not widely shared. Um, yet and still, charters and private schools continue to be 
led typically by white administrators, similar to traditional public schools, even in places where the majority of the kids served and sometimes growing numbers of teachers are teachers of color. Why do you believe that to be the case and what might we do um, to help to grow that pool of administrators of color for charter schools and private schools? That's, that's a good question. And obviously I know something that's on the mind of a lot of um, philanthropic organizations and others right now is how do we make sure that school leadership reflects um, the experiences of the children in their building? Because we know data shows us, of course, that particularly for black children, if they have one um, black teacher, their entire K-12 experience, they are li more likely to have a longer term um, higher academic outcomes. Um, so there's encouraging things that are happening uh, around the country. Um, there are some fellowship programs developing both at the national level with um, through uh, uh, like building excellent schools and other organizations and then sort of local um, state specific or community specific spinoff groups um, where they're, they are designing the opportunities um, for, for um, like uh, teachers of color who want to um, open their own schools, giving them the room to do that. Um, so here are a couple of obstacles though that, that, that we, you know, that, that we see. Um, number one, um, oftentimes the regulatory structure in place to open a charter school or uh, not necessarily as much a private school, of course, because they don't have to go through the same kind of government regulatory hurdles that a charter school has to go through to open. But the regulatory structure has gotten so complex to open a new charter school that it boxes out leaders of color. They have ideas of something that they would like to do or a community organization that they would like to partner with. And the, the process for opening a new charter is so political now everywhere and so regulatory, so regulatorily complex that people who don't have experience navigating complex bureaucracy already or have the funds to hire a lobbyist or whatever it is, oftentimes just get crushed um, under the weight of these systems. We saw that here in Texas in June, where an incredible um, African-American man in Houston who has been doing a program, a dropout recovery program inside the Houston school district wanted to open his own charter school to continue his program as a as a freestanding program um, you know without the bureaucracy of the big school district and the state board of education here in texas just summarily dismissed the man <laughs> he has 20 years of experience um, doing exactly what he wanted to do was willing to take all of the red tape that comes along with uh, running a charter school now. And he, he, I mean, he didn't, he didn't get a fair hearing for a minute. Um, made, uh, and our state board of education is, um, you know, uh, and, and nearly half um, elected officials of color themselves. So it's just this crazy cycle that I feel like we get, uh, that, that trap leaders of color out of opportunity. Um, one of the other ways that we do that is through the teacher certification process, which we've all seen all the data does not a, a teacher coming out of a teacher college at a university with a teacher certification does not um, does not necessarily have a better um, academic impact on children. And I think, you know, that is besides the data that has shown us that over and over again, our anecdotal experiences should tell us that too. We wouldn't have a problem with schools in this country if just having certified teachers was the answer because everyone in districts all over the country has certified teachers and we still, only a third of our children of color can read. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got problems to solve. Um, one thing that I will say is um, that in Texas, we're seeing some great strides here. Um, charter schools in Texas have three times as many Latino or Hispanic teachers, five times as many African American teachers, and our charter schools have done a really great job of creating grow your own leadership programs where they are um, identifying some of their really excellent 
um, standout teachers, making them um, eligible for administrator positions, and then helping them design and create their own schools. So we're seeing lots of growth and opportunity here, um, uh, but there's obviously a lot of work to be done. But a, you know, a big part of that work is getting these government regulatory hurdles um, out of the way for, for teachers of color. It's just I think I would. Oh, please go ahead, Professor Peterson. I think I would add to that, um, and I agree with all of that completely. But I would, I would add that uh, this may have been one of the mistakes of the choice movement uh, early on, and you can, in retrospect, understand it. I think it, from the very beginning, the choice movement realized they had to reach out to the minority community, the disadvantaged segment of our society, because that's where the need was the most urgent. And as we've seen, that is in fact the group that has been served by charter schools, by tax credit programs, by voucher programs. The school choice programs uh, are serving an underserved population. And if you look at public opinion, support for choice is much greater in the African-American community and the Hispanic community than it is in the white and Asian community. So there's a lot of goodwill that has been created by the focus of uh, school choice efforts. But uh, the school choice movement was sort of started by uh, uh, people who are like myself. You know, they, they wanted to be do good and they wanted to uh, 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 feel like they were making a contribution to society. Uh, and they tended to, uh, to work with people like themselves. And so I think the movement got funded by foundations that tended to think that uh, white leaders would do a better job. Uh, There's all for good reasons, but then they weren't probably self-consciously doing this. But uh, I think it's really something that the, the choice movement has to self-consciously, deliberately, consciously work to, to uh, attend to given, given the, the historic uh, trend that we've gone through. Just one follow-up question in this area. This question is so ripe and I'm, I'm hoping we get some questions um, from audience members as well that allow us to, to probe on this one just a bit further. But Starley, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, based on my own experience as, as a leader of color, I understand that in this incredibly polarized time um, where the, the, the country is, is particularly polarized on issues uh, related to education, um, including, uh, but not limited to school choice, uh, it, it can put leaders of color in an even more comfortable position with stepping forward um, and in their willingness to teach and especially to lead um, in charter and private schools. I'm wondering if you are seeing at all on the ground um, a, a greater degree of prospective leaders of color who are gun shy or who are um, concerned about what that, that political dynamic could mean for them personally and professionally. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I think this is one of the things that's really hard for school leaders. And I would, you know, I obviously am not, I don't talk to private school leaders as much as I do charter school leaders, but um, thinking about the, you know, the charter schools that scale, right, that tend to scale, KIPP, IDEA, you know, the, the big school networks, Uncommon, others, right, that we've all heard of, those, you know, obviously those large schools um, have all been led by, 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 white, uh, by white leaders. The, where we see the bulk of our leaders of color in the charter community in Texas, and I suspect this is probably true nationwide, is in single site, one or you know two campus um, charter schools. And for those school leaders right now, I was just having a meeting with one of them in Houston last week. I was visiting her campus, and it was an amazing conversation. And and I asked her like, you know, what can I do to help you? get more comfortable engaging in advocacy around charter schools because you know when when lawmakers think of charter schools we need them to think about the small charter schools in their communities that are serving you know the kids that that these lawmakers care about and she said i am not 
in this time, popping my head up right now, right? You, you pop your head up right now and you start complaining about stuff or you start making a big deal about things and you start, you know, pushing back on stuff and you are on a target list, right? For, for a whole host of, you know, potential grievances and they they feel like they are especially right now with all of the chaos that is happening on campuses related to covid they they cannot afford to take on the risk of being a target um for you know anti-crt activists or you know whatever whatever it is mask parents piss off about masks right? Like whatever it is, right? They just feel like they need to keep their head down. Um, and I think that is, that has led for us for sure in Texas to much slower growth uh, of, of charter schools that are led by leaders of color. They don't, like those are not the schools that are asking for a new campus or looking to, you know, move into a new community. And that is, hard and a challenge. And I, you know, I, I wish that it was something that we could, could solve more quickly. Okay, let me jump in here, Wayne, real quick, because I, you know, this is a passion of mine, right? So um, I think it's a very complex uh, issue with some simple, potential simple solutions, right? One of them, we just have to recognize that the advocacy for surrounding, surrounding school choice has not been for uh, very inclusive, particularly on the funding level and the ownership level for a long time. Right, so we have to think about what inclusiveness means in a meaningful way, not only around message but messengers, and how does that work, and who gets, and how do communities get approached? Because clearly, oftentimes I'm not the right person to go and talk to various communities, but sometimes that's what has been happening. Moreover, we need to be encouraging a lot more black ownership, not just black running of schools, but black ownership and entrepreneurship of these things, right? So when you look at the big foundations giving money, are they investing in scaling up ideas owned and operated and run by, by, by people of color? Are they, where's the next Rosenwald schools, for example, right? Is that coming? And if, and if so, how? And I think, you know, you look at someone like Sharif el who's doing this with those Black Educator uh, Entrepreneur Network, right? He's trying to build this up to create a new system. We also have to remember that, you know, the history of the modern private school choice movement is in Milwaukee with people like Howard Fuller. And the original goal of the Milwaukee Choice Program was not to create a voucher program. It was to create a Black-run and Black-led school district that was owned and operated by people who lived in the community. And so I think there's a lot of conversations that we're not having that go beyond just the idea of choice that I think are really important for movement advocates, movement groups like mine to engage in. Thank you, Robert. So we have hinted around the um, significance that the pandemic plays in this, but Paul, I wanna, wanna ask you more directly how would you say the pandemic has changed the environment for school choice? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, parents and all uh, are recognizing that the school system was not affected this past year, that the learning losses of many has been pretty substantial. And it's not like, uh, Americans are generous. They're sort of willing to say, all right, uh, you know, we understand this was a difficult time. Uh, consequences are severe, but we're, we're generous. However, uh, we need to do something about it. And, and parents on the ground are doing something about it. Um, we're seeing, you know, the other big thing that's out there is we're seeing enrollment across the country. We're seeing dropout rates increasing. Students in their last couple of years of school are sort of saying, if I'm just going to be learning online, why bother going to school? And now after being online for a year, they don't want to go back to school. So there's just a lot of, of loss of uh, learning at the end of school and also at the beginning of school. Parents are holding their kids back. Uh, maybe they will, that will all go away 
started again, but it's very important for schools to get started again as soon as possible and not delay any longer. Um, you know, delays are still continuing out there in parts of the country. So um, that's, that's fundamental. Uh, but then the other thing that's happening is that you're getting more in-person instruction in the private sector. The, the private schools have been losing ground. They've been losing enrollments right up to, to 2019, but they seem to be recovering now. We don't have really the best evidence yet, but all, and maybe Robert will, will add to this, but all the evidence that I see, I see enrollments recovering in the private sector. And that's in part because they refused to shut their doors. They couldn't shut their doors. If they shut their doors, they would lose the money they need in order to keep operating. So wherever they've been able to remain open, they have remained open. And that's, that's uh, increased confidence in the private sector. Uh, this is also true to a lesser extent in the charter sector, because a lot of charter, in some states, charter schools are subject to the same rules as district schools. So when you have had shutdowns, it's been across the board, but you're still seeing parents moving to the charter sector at uh, greater numbers than ever before. We have a recent study from the National Alliance and people are reporting that in various states around the country. So we have uh, a revival of the charter sector, but the homeschooling movement is the biggest change. Their, their numbers are doubling out there. And uh, the question is whether or not we're going to have homeschooling in new forms, whether we're gonna have pods, whether we're gonna have tutors, whether we're gonna have greater interaction between families and neighborhoods and the internet than ever before. So actually people are rethinking what schooling is all about uh, to a greater extent than ever before. So definitely the pandemic has changed the climate. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And I know Starley's on the ground in Texas seeing it in real life schools every day. Uh, from our perspective, you know, I think the idea that we've been saying for years that one size doesn't fit all became a reality for every single parent in America uh, with a pandemic, right? And so the, the system ostensibly failed quite a bit of families for, a, for an entire year to 18 months. And so what happened as a result of that? Uh, you know, parents are afraid to take their kids to school. They're worried about the pandemic. So, so are the teachers. And there's lots of this people becoming very, very frustrated. And what they did is they became more engaged. Parents got more engaged and more involved and started doing their own stuff. So Dr. Peterson talked about the rise of homeschooling. The fastest sector of, of homeschooling growth is among black mothers because they recognize that the system hasn't been working for their kids and they're now taking back that power and control. And when we, our polling at Ed Choice has shown at the beginning of pandemic, roughly 40% of the families didn't want to have schooling go back to the way it was, right? So full-time in-person schooling, there was 40%. That number has still stayed around 25% now. People, there's a large group of people that want a, a vibrant environment that's mixed and not just in-person all the time. One of the, the really ironic things about this shifting landscape for me uh, was illustrated with a comment I saw by a, a longtime um, opponent of, of additional parental options the, the other, just yesterday, I believe, uh, where she talked about um, her support for parents driving, going to other schools and school districts based on their preference for mask mandates or not or based on their preference for vaccines or not. And so the, the irony of it is, is that those reasons would be okay in her mind to, um, for parents to look for additional options, but the idea that a parent might want to choose an additional school option because of reading performance or mathematics performance or instructional strategy um, or instructional approach at a school wouldn't be appropriate. That I just find that in, incredibly um, ironic. Um, some might might even say hypo hypocritical. Oh, um, some might say hypocritical. Well, I think I think when I think when we all saw that tweet yesterday, we I think 
everybody's collective heads probably exploded in this whole choice community because we go, oh, now you understand why parents might want to be in a school where they feel like the administration is responding to their children's needs. I see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I think this, I, Wayne, I think this goes to show, so one of the participants asked about backpack funding. I think this goes to show this is why we need this concept of backpack funding, right? If a family wants to choose because they have higher quality, then that money should be put into a backpack and let them follow them around, right? And, and I think it's a really important point for us to be making. How we fund K-12 education in America is very arcane, very Byzantine, and it's not based on what a student or family needs to be self-actualized. And I think as you're having part of this pandemic conversation, Self-actualization and the ability to sort of like control your own destiny and self-determine have become important conversations and therefore funding should be discussed in the same way. Well, you know, this goes back to the first question that was asked, can we choose our way to better schools? And, uh, and uh, Robert, you sort of said, well, it all depends, uh, yes and no. And I think one of the things it depends on is to equalize the ground across all the choices out there. So like backpack funding would do that. So uh, if, if we could put everybody on an equal uh, fiscal plane and, and, uh, and people without means could have as much in the way of resources to go to the school of their choice as people who are well-to-do, that would be, and, that would do an amazing thing for school choice and for American education. Yeah, the injustice of this is just crazy. So let's just use my hometown of Indianapolis. If you're a third grade child who's low income in the city of Indianapolis and you go to a traditional school, you're getting 15 grand all in between state, federal, and local. That same child goes to a charter school uh, that is proven to be of higher quality and gets around eight and a half to nine grand. That same child goes to a non-public school through our voucher program here and gets $4,500. Since when did that child become worth that much less because they went to a different school type? I think it's a real question of like what's right and what's just and how do we, how do we allocate money effectively? I have one last question that I'll pose to the group. I'll ask all three of our panelists to respond to. And then we, we have a couple questions that have come in. We encourage um, audience audience members who have questions to submit to us, please do submit those and we'll get through all the ones we can. So with this last question, I, I will note um, in, in, in full transparency, some of you know I'm a former state commissioner of education. Um, I spent my career in the K-12 sector in traditional public schools. My wife did as well. My daughter attends a traditional public school, but I am an unapolog unapologetic um, advocate for parental options and school choice. The question I, I'd love to hear from you on is has school choice passed its peak? And related, are we going to see a revival in the traditional neighborhood school? Well, I, I suppose Robert should answer this question or, or, or maybe Starley uh, because they're right there on the ground. But to set the stage, I'd like to point out that uh, the opposition was at a, a tremendous crescendo before uh, the pandemic began. And, and the rate of opening up new charter schools was slowing down. And there seemed to be obstacles everywhere. Uh, the private sector was losing enrollments. There was a moment in 2017, 2018, when I thought, well, maybe the school choice movement is coming to an end. Um, I don't feel quite that way this, because of, of changes in the landscape, but I think this is a real question. It, is this really, uh, it had its day, it, was, it was, had, had its run, but it sort of uh, reached its peak and the pandemic isn't really gonna save it once things settle down. Yeah, you know, it's, I, um, it, it's definitely, Definitely a relevant question. Um, you know, we're, we are still seeing in Texas, certainly, and I think in many other states, significant enrollment um, increases year over year. But as the landscape becomes more um, 
competitive even for charter schools, right? There, there is um, what I see uh, a, tr a troubling trend of um, consolidation or um, I don't even know what the right word is um, necessarily, but where, where charter networks are becoming um, very large and um, you know, uh, having you know, huge enrollment um, uh, goals and targets themselves. And what I think is challenging about that and what concerns me about that is that as a charter school network becomes multi-state and um, homogenized, right, across, across communities, I don't know that the hallmark of charters being able to innovate um, and be responsive to kids on a smaller scale is, is um, can they still do that, right? I mean, I think one of the problems that we all acknowledge with, with school districts is that the, you know, the bureaucracy prevents innovation um, and responsiveness to children. And, and I don't want to see that in the school choice movement. And I think, um, there's a danger there that I, I think we become, become, we become the system in a way that, um, that makes us, that, that makes it even harder for us to differentiate ourselves and justify the, the regulatory structure that is in place to allow our survival. Um, so I, I am concerned about that. I'm concerned about some of the, you know, the trends that I am seeing. Um, and I will just say I'm a mom and I have a four-year-old and we're thinking right now about what we're going to do with our little girl for next school year. And, you know, talking to all the other moms in my kids' daycare class about what they're doing. We, we live in a part of, we're in Austin, Texas, and we live in a part of town where our schools are crummy, um, objectively. And, you know, what are we going to do about that? Um, and we, we actually happen to also be in a charter desert in this part of Austin, which is super frustrating for me, obviously. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, I'm, I'm living this, right? And I'm an upper middle class white woman. And I, I can't imagine what it is like for parents who don't have the information and advantages that I have to try to navigate when they know that their kid is about to come into a system that is not, you know, what they want for them. Um, so we have to resist the urge to, um, to be anti-competitive ourselves, I think, uh, as a charter community and make sure that we continue to push for a regulatory environment and policies that let school, that small schools um, and new schools come on the scene so that, so that parents continue to have new fresh options. So I get a, I get to ask answer like an academic again. Thank you, Sterling and Paul uh, and Wayne. The answer again is yes and no, in my opinion, and I'll tell you why. Look on the old model of private school choice and school building based vouchers and charter schools. You know we've seen growth as a result of the pandemic. There are 21 states passed 28 new or expanded programs for private school choice. But and we've seen growth in the charter sector. So that's been really good. But one of the challenges that we've seen in the last few years is basically all the schools look the same. Even the non-public schools and the charter schools and the public schools, there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference in terms of the teacher in front of a classroom in still the same way. What the pandemic is, I think, bringing out is moving the concept and conversation. This is where the answer is no, we haven't passed our peak. Because I think we're now getting to a new dynamism of not talking about school, but talking about schooling. Not talking about where you go, but talking about how you learn. And I think that's a much more dynamic conversation about, about what does mastery of, of subjects mean? If I can take an online course throughout school and pass an Algebra 1 test, do I need to go to school for that anymore? And how do I do that? There's a whole different, I think, growing potential dynamic that the pandemic began to sort of expose the potential of this new movement for, of the school choice. And that's why PAC PAC funding is so important. That's why a place like West Virginia's ESA program is so important because it's basically an education savings account is funding put into a backpack or on a card, which can be used at any school setting or any non-school setting that's approved. 
And so it's a really unique way to customize and individualize. And I think, I think we haven't passed this because I think that dynamism is yet to be seen. I totally agree with you on that, Robert, that, that the, we, um, there's huge potential there, but I, I, I just don't know that parents are like ready for that really, right? Like are, are parents really ready to do the a la carte um, choosing like, you know, like we all hoped that they would when the first ESA program was passed. And I just, I just don't know, are, I mean, are we ready for that? Are, are parents equipped to do that? And maybe the pandemic has, has made, made parents feel more ready for that because they have seen, and, you know, just the, the rise in comfort level with, with online learning generally and all of the stuff. I mean, I, I'm bombarded with Facebook ads from out school and all of these cool, you know, things that, that I could do with my kid, but I, I don't know. I just, I, I worry. I will say this right out of my little, my little anecdotal focus, focus group of 22 moms in, in central Austin at an expensive, fancy daycare, no one is talking about that. Yeah. Right. So how do we, how do we take that from a concept into something that a, that a parent can act on. I and think we're going to say, see that. I think we're going to see that in West Virginia if and, and other states that have passed broader ESAs. And we know from uh, Arizona and Florida that the longer the programs exist, the more customization that happens. Um, but I've said this a thousand times. My son went to a great charter school um, and he really should have gone to YouTube University because he learned more. Um, and, and I think there's a real conversation about um, how kids are learning, particularly in communities of color, because they're not being taught by people that look and, and understand those communities. And this new way of teaching and learning is a way to get to that. It's a way to get, I, I'm using this analogy again, to the new Rosenwald type schools. Are parents ready for that? This is the debate. Do you do you tear a bandaid off all the way or do you pull it off slowly? All these kind of conversations. You know, and then there's my dear friend Checker Fins, who will ask us where are our standards and where are our accountability measures, and and these are all challenges that we face. But I think parents, I think parents have the capabilities. There's not a question about capabilities. I don't believe it shouldn't be a question. It should be about the opportunities and the access that we can try and create for them. I'll give one comment, and I want to get to some audience questions. But I'll share with you guys one of the the challenges I faced in, in thinking about this in, in the state government context. Um, and this is from someone who's a, a, a choice advocate. In the near term, and I think for the foreseeable future, I, I can't see us getting to a place where all parents will choose. And so there, there's, there's, at least for the foreseeable future, traditional public school districts are going to be I would say even have to be a part of how we provide high quality education to students. And so here's what, what I wrestle with. Given, the, given that reality, how can we at the same time pass policies and do things that ensure that high quality opportunities are available to parents and families to choose from, while also ensuring that traditional public school districts that will likely lose enrollment because parents are choosing um, other, other school options, have the resources they need to provide high quality education, often for kids who are left, um, whose parents did, did not choose something different. It's, it's a real struggle I face, even as a, as a choice okay. advocate in state government. You know, and, and Wayne, I, I wanna make sure Professor Peterson talks about this as well, but I would just say this following on that. I'm going to push back on one quick thing. Um, I do think all parents are choosing, right? They're just choosing something called a checkbook choice, right? If you're buying a house because you want a good school district, you're making a choice, right? And, and the problem with that kind of choice, whether you, you make it through a checkbook or you pay for it through private education or you get lucky through a lottery or you pay for it and get a lucky at a voucher or you lie about your address or you use someone else's address, all of those are choices that are getting made every day. The question that I think is important for us to ask, which is why backpack planning is so important, is 
if we continue to allow the de facto choice of housing to determine the quality of schooling, um, we will never get past this problem and we will get past our peak. And so I think a lot of parents are making a choice. They're just making choices based on the, what, what they think is best for their kids by buying a house. And I think we've got to disconnect those two things. Redlining is a terrible thing we did in this country and we've got to get rid of that. And so I agree with you that, that, that it's a challenge, but the current structure is built to not ever change unless it, unless it gets rid of this sort of housing assignment system. And I, I would agree with you, Robert. Uh, for example, I said my, my daughter attends a, a traditional public schools. Uh, I define that as a choice, right? Mm -hmm. We have chosen a traditional public school for my daughter because if I wasn't satisfied with her, I'd send her somewhere else, whether it's a private option or another public option. So when I, when I spoke to parents who um, are not choosing in the immediate, I'm not thinking about parents like me. I'm thinking more um, often parents who are much lower income, less educated, and maybe not as ta not as plugged in to the options and the possibilities. I mean, it's still the reality in traditional uh, public school dis districts that, I mean, kids just pop up at school, um, you know, in, in September, in October, uh, without registering. And so that those are more the, the families and the, the kids that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So we do have some some great um, some great questions from the audience, um, and we only have a couple minutes. I'd love to to ask ask some of these, get through as many as we can. Here here's one I'll throw out, and any panelists who'd like to can respond. Um, how will technology change all K twelve schools, and how students will learn in the future? Given a more remote subject matter expert can now become part of those schools via Zoom. Well, you know, this is a topic that I have uh, thought about for a long time. And I was a very early advocate of uh, virtual education, learning online. Um, I, uh, I really thought the Florida virtual school was the school of the future. And uh, I still think that there's a lot to be offered uh, from online learning. But I must say that the pandemic has uh, thrown a, a cautionary sign up at me. Uh, there are parents out there who really have enjoyed having their children learning online, but I must say most parents found that this was not a very effective learning experience for their children. And we did have serious learning loss last year who knows what the cause was? Was it just the pandemic and the sense of a panic that existed in society? Was it the masks that people were wearing in the school building, which prevented uh, the kind of uh, communication that we just assume exists? Or was it online learning? But the best evidence we have from the most careful studies is that online learning, as it's being taught today, is not uh, as effective as in-person learning. Now, maybe if you embed online learning in the classroom, something that is called blended learning, and you use technology as part of the school day, or maybe if you can transform the way in which we teach online, but it take, it's gonna take a huge capital investment in order to bring the quality of online learning up to the level of the entertainment industry, which is what students expect when they go online. They wanna see something like, well, Star Wars isn't the right thing. It's gotta be much better than that. You know, It's gotta be a truly great visual experience in order to really absorb people. And I'm afraid that's not what ordinarily happens when you, when you go online in an educational setting. So I think technology has potential in the long run, but it's not, we're not gonna get there overnight. Yeah, I just, I will just add, um, you know, I know I know I'm like beating my uh, regulatory red tape a horse to death over here, but, but I will say just to, you know, this, this example, there are regulations in place that prevent schools from doing this. They prevent, they say, you cannot have a teacher teaching a class who is not live in your building. So charter schools, for example, had, you know, we, we had several charter schools who said, you know what, this is going to be great. We're going to take some of the, you know, some of the 
um, things that were broken from the system before in the pandemic that the pandemic just exposed, right? And we're gonna fix them. So here's an example. We have a, a network of dropout recovery schools in Texas. So these are schools that take kids that have already dropped out of school. And these kids, you know, two thirds of them have babies of their own. I mean, these are the kids that are the most challenged kids in our entire educational system, right? Many of them are homeless or have experienced home homelessness, really serious challenges that they're trying to overcome. These schools are bringing them back into the educational system so that they can get their high school diploma. Most of them couple that with some kind of workforce certification so that these kids are coming out of not only with their GED or their high school diploma, but also ready to work and, and with something that will lead to you know, a, a pathway to the middle class for them. They were having trouble finding Spanish teachers for their kids but they had a Spanish teacher at one of their campuses in Corpus Christi who adapted really well to the online environment. She was awesome. She liked doing it online. She had a baby at home so she could be there with her baby and still teach her classes online. The state regulatory agency wouldn't let her be the teacher of record for Spanish for all of their campuses. She would have had to travel all over the entire state of Texas and visit each campus every day in order to be their Spanish teacher. That's crazy, right? So we have this regulatory structure that prevents technology from helping us solve our own problems. So we have to address that, right? We, we have to address the regulatory structure that prevents, prevents schools from doing rational things um, and using technology in a way that will actually allow kids to benefit from, from remote teachers or from um, innovative programming or, you know, think all kinds of crazy things that you wouldn't think schools can't do. They can't do it. Um, so anyway, we got to get all that stuff solved. Um, but, but, I, I'm yeah. sorry. I think we need to connect though with the kids if we're going to continue to do this. Right. So, and here's what I mean by that. We can talk as adults about what technology needs to be in the classroom, but the kids are using it every day in their own lives in ways that we as and advocates and educators don't really understand. Right. And so let me give you a quick example. You know, when when I was growing up, you know, you did your homework quietly in your room or at a table and you, you, you finished it. When you finished, you got it all done and you turned it in, et cetera, et cetera. I remember one time my son's upstairs and and I hear a bunch of noise and I'm like, what are you doing? What are you telling you? He goes, you're talking on the phone. Why are you doing that, son? He goes, no, no. We're just on a group chat talking about the problem that we have that we've been trying to work out through getting YouTube examples and other examples. This conversation from a kid's perspective and a student's perspective is where we need to go when it comes to technology, as opposed to from an adult perspective. And I'll, I'll just name the challenge that that Starley raised about about the regulations being being problematic and those barriers getting the way and do of doing what's right for kids is a monumental problem and and the reality is these aren't these aren't things that just happen these regulations and barriers were put in place intentionally often often was the is the case that they're put in, in place for adult convenience or protect adults or, or to make sure that that there that there's a specific job in every school or in every school district, and it it's it's so sad though that that people fight to maintain those types of barriers, even when it results in kids in schools and school districts not having access to people who teach world languages or not having access to people who teach higher level mathematics. So we have time for one last question I'll pose. This came, comes from the audience, and I think it's a great way um, to, to end our, our conversation. It's a very student, family-centered um, question, and it is, how can we better support um, parents in making great school choices for their kids, regardless of what those choices might be? Wow, that's a tough question. Information and uh, a ready availability of that information and transparency. Basically, school systems today try to keep you from learning the most important things about a school. Uh, that is to say, how good are the teachers? How, how much are kids learning? Uh, what, what's the environment like? So um, yeah, transparency information is the solution. 
the first step at least. I will, I will also add that creating a, a, a culture of expectation of options is really helpful. And a state like Arizona um, and Florida, they have that, right? Parents that Arizona is my home state. Um, parents just have an expectation that they will have options for where their kids go to school, whether that's a charter, another school in their school district, another school district, um, through a private school choice program. There's just a culture of expecting options. And, and I think that kind of, and it goes um, to the point of collective information sharing when you're in that place. Um, you know, the parents, parents will find like-minded parents. They will find parents that have kids like their kids and they will talk to each other. And if there is an, if there is an expectation that they have options, parents are going to learn how to make good choices because they're going to talk to, to other parents with kids like their kids. Um, and that's, um, so I, I, you know, when I, I think about like the most important thing that we could do, it's to, it's to have as many school choice programs as we can in a place so that there is an expectation of choices. We are at time, so we're going to have to close there, but I want to thank our fantastic panelists. Um, I want to thank the Hoover Institute at Stanford University and the HESI program, the um, Hoover Education Success Initiative, the Harvard Program on Education Policy and Governance, Texas Charter Schools um, Association, and EdChoice. This has been a fantastic conversation, and I thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. So thank you, everyone. I look forward to seeing you around. Thank, thank you, you very Wayne. much. Appreciate it, Wayne.